again for my wonderful guest. Wonderful guest, would like to introduce yourself. We're going to start with Tanya because I only thought you was going. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Tanya Todd. I am an author and actress from Las Vegas. Tanya! I'm passing the mic to Kevin. There, there go. you go. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, Kevin E. West, veteran television actor, three-time author, corporate speaker, all-around smartass, and from originally Nashville, Tennessee. I'll pass it to Craig. We're gonna say the we're gonna say the end for Alex. <laughs> My name is Craig. I'm the founder and managing talent manager of CK Talent Management. We manage talent. So <laughs> oh, Alex, last uh, but not least. Yeah, that I like Craig's lead on that. Yeah, I'm the founder of a talent management company called The Green Room. I've been around now uh, nine years or so. Did my standard uh, mailroom and all the acronym talent agencies, you know, over the last uh, several years prior to that. And, and uh, yeah, now I help people get famous for a living and then I take 10%. And so long as people still like my face, I'll keep doing it. So let's start off with what everyone wants to know. What should be, let's go with managers first. What should be the goals of creatives to get represented this year? What do they need to have? Uh, Kevin, oh, I know I do. I, was, I, I hope I, I drank my milk, just one of my almond milk. Cause I feel like I'm growing. Uh, uh, not, not to mention, per what Alex and Craig both have said, since, um, since I'm certainly the old guy here who has been doing this for a long time, considering my first guest star was on Matlock. Just let that sink in for a second. Uh, thank you, Craig, for the smile. I appreciate that. No, I love uh, Matlock. I've, I've watched Matlock. I, uh, I heard about I it on Matlock. The Simpsons. Yeah, thanks. I like that. <laughs> That's uh, touche. Oh well dear said. God! Well said, Tanya. I, I was gonna <laughs> I was gonna say before Tanya was born, but I decided to stay away from that, and then she did it anyway. Um, <laughs> but I not only with regard to the to the Matisse conversation, I think that one of the, the uh, those canned answers are certainly correct, and they're not what you need to hear because I've had a ton of representatives in my long uh, career. But the other reality is sometimes um, you already have a Matisse, so as much as you may want to sign a Matisse. Uh, that's why I've equated in all the business education speaking I've done over the years as the founder of the Actors Network that, um, you know, a no today is not a no in perpetuity. Unfortunately, uh, my community often takes it that way and it's unintelligent. So one of the things I would say to creatives is you have to have an interest in being creative far beyond just the idea of being wealthy or famous. And if those are your two main drives, that's great. I would then recommend that you put a time limit on how long you're going to commit per Alex and be happy in your life to pursue it. And if you don't reach that benchmark by a certain time, get out. Uh, I would say that to my community loud and clear all the time. There are far too many unhappy and creative is a broad word. We have authors here. There's all forms of creativity. But if you're talking about with two managers here, performance creative, there are far too many unhappy people with a headshot in Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and every market in between. So um, I, I would certainly recommend that um, you engage yourself with yourself about why it is you want to be a creative and, and focus on that along with being happy outside of um, the tools and tasks and the benchmarks and the to-dos that you have to be even to just be a person engaged in the profession because uh, it's going to take a lot more resilience than that to um, hang in there through this profession. And speaking, of, actually piggybacking on that, Kevin makes a, a good, several good points. Uh, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that, ladies. I mean, I didn't know Craig and Alex. And, and, and that Tanya. was a dark time. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a dark time. Um, That's Kevin's job to be the smart Alex today. <laughs> well, I don't know. Alex and I do a road show. Uh, <laughs> You know, but when I founded the Actors Network in 1991, uh, you know, pre-digital, pre-cell phones, analog world, and bearing in mind just for Alex and Craig and Tanya's edification that it was not a workshop place because that's, we were the anti-workshop place, but it won awards because of what we did with the information. And I would even argue today, because Alex is a thousand percent right, and I know Craig understands and Tanya understands that, but I would argue today that our community is even less aware of everything that you just said. And part of that is because of the disbursement of information based on digital technology, but it's still the same thing that goes all the way back to three decades ago, which is the fact that we do not have any form of educational system in this country as it relates to making money as a creative artist, especially a performer. 
that actually exudes the value of what Alex just said. And that's part of the problem. So you don't have it from parents. Now I got, I became an actor later in life, but you don't have parents espousing this. They don't know their butt from a hole in the ground with regards to this. They don't seem to want to apply what they already know to this profession when their child or themselves chooses to get into it, which is weird because this is a multinational, multi-geographical, multi-billion dollar industry and a business where people make money just like any other industry is. <laughs> and so the fact that you choose to somehow think, oh, I mean, I know so many people who had, had successful businesses and moved to Los Angeles and all of a sudden they decided they want to miss that chance to finally be an actor. And they literally seem to forget everything they'd learned about being a business person and an adult, as Alex said, just because they got a headshot done. And mm -hmm. I would I would look at them and go, have you lost your collective mind? And so part of the problem is the educational system only wants to focus on the artistic side, which is great. They don't want to talk about the realities of, of monetization and the realities of, of having to manage that. And so therefore, yeah, there's no infrastructure at USC and at ACT and at all the Ivy League schools about the other side of this profession. And so you wind up with the same canned answers and the same stuff that you get from everybody just about this and a demo reel and a thing. And there's no real infrastructure in the orientation of what it is to be a pursuing professional performer to but make a living in a career. I said, then what the F are you listening to the rest of them for? All I can say, Craig, is I wrote 10 commandments for the Actors Network in 1993. <laughs> and number 10 said the following. If you don't book the job, it may as well be someone you know and like. You can, you, can walk, you can walk 15 people of the same ethnicity with a similar hairstyle into a room with the same five pages and not one person is going to read it the same. And I, I've never, and I was a competitive collegiate athlete. So the fact that I don't, I don't, I've never transferred that kind of competition to the arts because we are unique. You have to learn what your skill set is and how to use it the best you can. Go in and do the best job. And my philosophy since day one has always been make it really hard on them to not hire you. And that's your only job. And so the idea that, that someone is going to try and torch, firebomb, and to your point, yes, be jealous. I mean, again, this is all... It's, it's to the point of what Alex said. It's, it's, you, you don't have the proper mentor from the time you start. You don't have it from the educational system and many representatives you don't get it from in terms of how to think about how you're in this profession. Because what you just said is mentality and thought process. What Alex said is mentality. It's a philosophy of how you view this profession, which is everything that I've spoken to my community about for three decades now. Uh, it is an incredibly competitive industry. And you, to your point, you have to function as such if you are going to win, in my opinion. You don't have to be negatively, individually competitive and denigrating to others to do that. But you, but you certainly cannot deny and you certainly cannot pretend. And Lord knows I agree with you, Alex, per the writer analogy of the rejection letters. We do have a community who likes to spend a lot of time in the misery loves company reality. And I, I, to Tanya's point, I probably was not as proficient as it, at it as you have been early in your time transitioning from being a writer. It probably took me a little bit longer when I moved to Los Angeles to start recognizing the people and going, uh, no, you are off my dartboard. You don't make it into my life. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Have a nice time. Uh, I'm not going to keep you because misery loves company. I, I don't have any time for that shit in, uh, in this profession. There's, it's too easy. There's too much of it. It's every single day and it will unequivocally uh, the, w wear off on even the strongest person. Well, it's it, it, to me, it's I still going to be for, for both. Yeah. For okay. Alex or Craig, I mean, to me, it's just confidence of proficiency. Uh, uh, again, being an athlete, you don't, this is the point of, 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 of what Alex said about you don't get to be you don't get to play in the team because you stood outside the stadium for 10 years. Right. You actually have to show up and do some shit and you actually have to fail and get better at that and work hard at it. And this is part of the problem of where the last two decades since the turn of the 21st century has happened with technology is it is much easier to live in the fantasy world that you're better at something that you've actually never done. And so, yes, Truth. granted, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a young human. I've been on the planet breathing for a while, but I was a young athlete. And, you know, I grew up in an era where we still got paddled in high school. And I grew up in an era that when you didn't make the team, they cut you in front of other people. Yeah. You didn't get you didn't yeah. get to stay on the team because your parents bought you a glove. If you wanted to play, you actually had to get better. And I had a tough old school acting coach when I first moved to Los Angeles, who was from New York. And he was the nicest guy on the planet, but he didn't he didn't care. I mean, he, he 
Toby McGuire, Walt Goggins, and I studied with the same guy. It's like his whole thing was you're going to have to walk in a room and be really, really good right from the start. And, and the question, ladies, is what percentage, just like the rest of the planet, especially in sports, are willing to do change to evolve to quickly and implement the premise and the philosophy and the reality of what Alex just said. And what and he, he said it, without saying it is treat it like a job. And, and, the, yeah, and, exactly, and, the, Tanya. and the statistics of who makes money in SAG-AFTRA for the last 40 years bear out the percentage of people willing to make that kind of commitment because it's 1% on a good day. <laughs> so before we go, let's, uh, can we wrap up with one piece of advice that we know that all creatives were going to need in 2022 as they go forward? And where people can find out more about you if you want them to find out more about you. Well, I'm easy. I'm KevinEOS.com. That's easy to find me and the Kevin E on YouTube for all the stuff I do regarding business or show business. But the bottom line is to what Alex just said, and it's my religion. If you want to see things change for you in 2022, I recommend you change your behavior, whatever that means to you in your life and your goals. You have to, life is not about words. It's about your behavior. So whatever it is you're doing, whatever your game plan is, whatever you put into your life every single day, every single week, then if you want your 2022 to change, you don't have to change necessarily what your career is. But you have to change your behavior. Then wow. you can find out everything at www.andithoughtladies.com. I did that slowly. So one of the managers on here will know that we took their advice. Moving on. Oh, okay. Uh, Kevin E. West, veteran television actor. Let's see. My reference usually is my first guest star was Matt Locke. So that'll tell you how long I've been doing this. Um, all the way from stand-up comic improv artist, uh, founder of the Actors Network, award-winning uh, business organization for actors as well as a three-time author, author and international show business expert speaker. I do. And I'm going to start off with our first question, which is what is the business behind, what does it mean? Like the business part behind the creative? What do you guys do? How do you do it? That is a Grand Canyon wide question, ladies. <laughs> of course, of course. Okay, let's try to do it with five sentences or less. Can we do that? <laughs> Well, I, I think for representatives, it's going to be a, a slightly different attitude than it is for a performer. And if you're a performer, then it depends on whether or not you're trying to make money in which aspect of performing and influencer content is completely different as well as mm -hmm. creative author writing book content. So I think some of the business from each of those would be would be probably a little bit different in mm -hmm. from my chair anyway. So for you as an actor, you, you've made a career. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us like, what part of the business that you have to understand to make this career as an actor? Well, that's 125 hours in my head. So I'll, I'll try and spare you guys 124 of that in 59 minutes. Um, <laughs> but one of the first things I would say for most actors is we don't, we don't tend to understand that part of getting into the business means that you are a, you just happen to be a physical product for sale. And it's very disconcerting and very insensitive for a lot of us. And that's coming from a Pisces. Um, but the truth of the matter is, no matter how much Jen may love you as a person, uh, the reality is you are, uh, you are a piece of product she is trying to get bought and sold. Uh, and that's just a reality that we don't. And if you, if you can start with that reality about the business, I think it actually makes being an artist much easier, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the aside, I mean, there is a lot of, there is a lot of that performers, clients, and agents have in common in that. A lot of actors do believe that all they need to do is just get a picture, have a demo reel and get an agent and it's all done. I can just, you know, wait for, you know, the shit to just start flying in. Mm -hmm. But uh, my, my favorite little story about uh, about the perception of of being an actor is um, if you're young and your daughter comes home and tells the, you know, the fairly well to do father that I've fallen in love with an actor. His first comment is, oh, Jesus, how's he ever going to pay the bills? And as soon as actors say that we have a problem from a union standpoint of the fact that 98% of our membership doesn't make any money, everybody thinks that we're all millionaires. So I find that paradox quite um, telling. And so the reality is, is that 98% of, of, of actors, not necessarily influencers or content creators or other elements, but, you know, don't make more than $20,000 a year. And yet, uh, the perception is, is that everybody is an A-list actor. So I think that also bleeds into the mentality of sort of what happens when someone goes to sit down at Sue's office or sits down at Craig's office or sits down in front of Jen 
uh, is that there's this perception that when, if you say yes to me and you decide to represent me that, you know, it's champagne wishes and caviar dreams. So uh, that's just, a, that's a psychological challenge that I've spent, uh, oh, I don't know, three decades mm -hmm. talking to my community about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a chapter in my book that's called To Be a Professional. And to be a professional doesn't have anything to do with how old you are, with how many credits you have, how much money you've made or how much money to Craig and everyone's point, how much you think you should make. Uh, to me, it's uh, if, if, and I've done this many, many times and I continue to do it, like I said, y'all just send them to me, I'll straighten them out. Uh, in, <laughs> terms, in terms of, I think that, that if I were a representative, uh, I, I want somebody to have the proper professional perspective. Sure, you want to have the proper tools. Of course you do. That's just kind of a given to me, like breathing. But proper professional perspective is what, uh, and it's not new. Don't think it's just digital technology or just influencers. Or, no, nah, it's been a problem since I first started talking to actors in 1991. So you either, you either have the proper prof professional perspective or you're probably going to be a real challenge for your representative. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Is, is that where you come in, Kevin, to help the prepare before they even get to that point? All, of the, I, all of the above, Jojo. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I'm uh, building an online program now just because of having closed my organization six plus years ago. But it doesn't matter whether you have never done a thing in your 17 or never did a thing in your 40 and decide you want to do this or whether you're somebody who's been doing it for 10 years. And like Sue just said, or Craig has experienced it doesn't matter whether you're hot at first and then it cools off for months or you're hot for a while and then your career goes down or you decide to get married and have a baby and you're trying to come back to the industry. It doesn't really matter. Uh, our perception and mentality tends to be the thing that, that takes us down. And again, the difficulty of what Jen and Sue and Craig know, you know, makes it even worse. I mean, guys, I, I, ladies, you guys know this. I've joked about this. I had to, I had to read for Castle six times. I had to read for Bones five times. I had to read for Y50 three times. I, I read for Criminal Minds once. I mean, there's no, I mm -hmm. promise you, if there was a formula to how you make millions of dollars in this business, my ass would have found it a long time ago mm -hmm. in a galaxy far, far We away. all would have already found yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just, you, you got to believe in who you are as a person or believe in what you do as an agency or your identity. And you have to have your professional standards and you got to trust your gut but you also have to work hard. And unfortunately, and that's why I get to say it because I've been doing it for a long time. My community in general doesn't really like the four letter word work in general. Not, not obviously not everybody, but in general, they don't. Okay. So my question is how important is relationships in business, in the business, especially the business behind being creative? How important is a relationship? Number one. It's the most important. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's number yeah, one. I at the end of the day, relationships are based on trust, and it doesn't matter Absolutely. whether it's in, whether it's intimate, uh, sibling, uh, parental, or representative. You have to trust your talent. Your talent has to trust you. And uh, from our end, we 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 have to show up when required to show up, and we have to be prepared. And that's where the trust starts. And from that point, okay, let's talk yeah. about trust, Kevin. None of my talent have a contract with me. Not one single one. As yeah. a contract with me. And if I were a talent of yours, Sue, the, the, for the way that I was raised, the way I lived my life, um, I wouldn't need one either because I'm a Absolutely. person of my word. But yeah. again, again, that's part of the what I consider to be sort of that the essence and identity of, of who somebody is and how they choose to run their life. Because I, however one chooses to run their business or their company, and I've, I've done both and also been you know, an, an actor as well. Uh, it still comes down to whether you have to believe in what you believe in and you have to believe in your roster mm -hmm. and who they are. And when you send them in and casting sees it, then over the course of time, of course, then they trust you, the representative, be an agent or a manager. And that's how Craig can manage to get off of just using tools and an email to get people signed to a contract because they trust him that those people are not only going to be what's on the reel, but they're also going to actually show up, not just physically, but artistically. So it, Absolutely. It, it's all based on trust. I, you couldn't, you can't, I mean, in my category, I, I'm in the toughest category in Hollywood and I always have been. Uh, and it's even worse now over the age of 40 and not being a star. But if you, if that person doesn't trust that you're going to knock it out of the park every single time you have an audition, mm -hmm. 
Uh, yes. You're not going to keep represented at a certain age in Los Angeles because they just can't afford to. I mean, I have an audition I have to do 15 minutes after we get off this thing. Oh, scruffy, well, scruffy, well, scruffy drunk, ladies. That's why I look like this today. Scruffy <laughs> drunk. Basically, Charles Bukowski, but let's not judge. Uh, <laughs> only he's creepy guy. But it's just based on trust, and that's punctuality. It's professionalism. It's your, it, like Sue just said, it's also, you know, if you need help trusting that you would say to your representative, listen, I'm in a bad space. I mean, I have mm. eight actor friends who've committed suicide in my time in Los mm. Angeles. So this is just a reality. But the, the, the word trust belies every single relationship we all have, and it, this business doesn't change that. Kevin pretty much summed up what my question was, and that had to do with the the trust establishment early on um, with the, the talent. And um, so, yeah, you, you were spot on with that, Kevin. Thank you. Tanya, to your question, I would say this in terms of, uh, and I'll just do it from the chair of that. I, that I'm sitting in on this panel is one of the tips that I would say to actors when I speak would be find the joy in being the solution, not the concern for trying to book the job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's nice. Um, so because Love at the that. end of the day, that's, that's, that's really what we do. We mm -hmm. just solve problems and fill mm -hmm. gaps. And yep. there has to be a joy in that when you go to step in an audition, as opposed to just, you know, again, the line from chorus line, God, I hope I get it. Uh, I get mm -hmm. that. But at some point, there's a transition to that, that, that makes you, that makes the talent you already have come alive much more mm -hmm. than if you didn't. So that's what I would say in, in parting. Thank you. Uh, I'm at the Kevin E. I'm pretty easy to find. You put Kevin E. West in Google, and unfortunately, due to my background, it's pretty simple. But I am like you, Tanya. I'm. I did two episodes of The Righteous Gemstones right before COVID, and Danny McBride has not figured out yet what they're doing with season two. And so I'm, I am sitting here waiting for HBO to call. So not really waiting, <laughs> doing nothing else. But I'm hoping that at, that at some point they decide to finally finish shooting season two. So I'm, I'm pretty much all over the place. So I'm not, I'm not a hard guy to find. What y'all want to hear from our wonderful guest? Wonderful guest, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> I am happy to, everybody. My name is Kevin E. West, and I am a veteran television actor. I've been doing this uh, in Hollywood. I, I, I grew up in rural Tennessee, uh, so I have the, um, the southern part of me, but I've been in Los Angeles for three decades. My first TV show was Matlock, so that tells you how far back I go. My most recent show um, was is a show on HBO called The Righteous Gemstones. I finished two episodes of that. Literally got off the plane on March, Friday the 13th from South Carolina. And 36 hours later, they shut the city down. So we've all been in COVID land. But uh, I'm a former athlete, was a college golfer. Love anything outside with a, with a, with a, with a ball or a score that makes you sweat. Uh, I grew up fishing in, you know, cut off jeans. I, I sometimes am affectionately known as the Hollywood redneck. Um, I've offered three books, authored three books, one on showbiz, two on a gift book series, and I'm also a corporate speaker uh, on communication, also known as the communication entrepreneur. And that's me. Wow, you're so well-rounded. Yes. As you went from art to business, like corporate business. I know, I know. How did you do that? Basically, yeah. it's basically it's every day, all day long. That statement of, you know, again, we use this phrase in show business, show business. You know, as they always say, it's not show art. Uh, I don't think that I necessarily meant to take that personally when, when I first decided to become an actor. But the truth of the matter is I grew up at, at a very, in a very rural part of Tennessee. Uh, my mother was a country singer. Um, I was not born there. I grew up there. And I think, unfortunately, from a young age, uh, because of slave labor, of course, I have to say it that way, because I was 11 years old and forced to work in my mom's restaurant. So I think that's where all the business stuff came from early in my life, even though I am a Pisces. Um, and then, of course, the sports part of me is, sure, there's creativity in that to a degree, but it's still, you still have to have your left brain very alive and very focused. Uh, and then I naturally took calculus. I took accounting. I took all of these things that sort of belied my nature until I finally discovered psychology. And the second that I discovered my interest in psychology, which is just, com it was completely natural, it was organic. I didn't plan this. Um, it, 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 that began the change, I think, in me. And this was in my early 20s. And so I didn't even come to California until I was 24, which is late by Hollywood standards. That's late. Uh, I didn't know anybody, you know, not an exceedingly pretty boy. I'm not, don't look like Brad Pitt. So I, it was a slow start 
you know, for me in Hollywood, I was a stand-up comic, I was an improv artist, and then I turned towards the reason I came here, which is what we call scripted, whether it's feature films or whether it's TV. And I just wound up working in television. And so um, that's, and now all of Hollywood's moved towards television. There's now 425 television shows. Um, and so that's kind of how I do the left brain, right brain dance every single freaking day, minute to minute. I go from something that I got to be left brain to sitting down and writing something. I started a, a poem uh, regarding COVID, uh, you know, so it's, it's actually, a, I'm a ping pong ball. It's like bing, 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 constantly. That's awesome. I have to ask because um, we we grew up and both of our mothers, they uh, own their own businesses. So, yes, we we are familiar with, we don't call it slave labor because, you know, like, I don't know, maybe it's just in Maryland, but in Maryland that if you're under, like, you know, the, the working age, you can work for your family business and get paid. Um, paid. <laughs> I'm, how often, I was like, how <laughs> often do you see that pay? <laughs> until pay you get to that working age. <laughs> oh, hell no. There was, well, again, obviously, you use the word slave being a white boy from the South. You, it's a dicey um, thing to say today's terms. But, you know, the bottom line is, is that working as a kid for nothing for your family in the South today and in many places in this country, be it Montana, Idaho, any place that would just that, you know, I think they would just call that Monday. I mean, it's not okay. it's not something that's unusual. I don't say it in some way that makes it unusual. Uh, and in part because I didn't have a father, it was kind of also babysitting. You know, my mother looked at it as if you're here working for me and with me, then I know where your butt is. I don't have to worry where your butt ain't. So um, I make the joke and call it that. But. Uh, the truth of the matter is working as a as a punk little kid for your for your family, your parents is pretty much just a day that ends in Y. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it, it does. It, it really, it really, really does. Okay. Well, my question was going to be like, because like I because of that, we have this strong business basis, and um, when we need people who are very artist. I, and this is Artist Wednesday, remember? Yeah, this is Artist Wednesday, and. I should, I guess I shouldn't ask that question. No, no, go ahead. It. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Ask the well, we meet people who are very, very, very artistic. And when you go, well, have you thought about the monetary side of that? Have you decided to build a foundation um, where, and they're like, you don't think about these things. That's what you have agents for. And you're like, um, yes. how do you deal with that? Because I deal with it terribly. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's two sides to that because for me, ladies, um, there is the Kevin part of that. And then there's the Kevin who founded an organization that was based on the very training of that. So, uh, you know, my book, Seven Deadly Sins, The Actor Overcomes, this is a book that is exceptionally valuable to somebody who wants to consider being an actor for money. And a lot of actors will tell you, well, of course I want to make money because that's what everybody does. Like, well, no, actually, it's not what everybody does. Some people actually just enjoy being artists for the sake of being artists, and they're not trying to monetize their art. And I think in part, to be honest with you, the best answer I can give you ladies on this program is to share with you that because I am a Pisces and because I'm actually an exceptionally sensitive person who just happens to have a tough sort of rural Tennessee third baseman side to him as a man, um, it was necessary for me to learn how to bifurcate the artistic side of my soul as an actor versus the left brain side of me that understood it as business. And the way that I did that was understanding that it doesn't matter who you are, you are simply a product for sale. Literally, whether you're selling one of my other books, a product for sale, or you are the product for sale, which is what being an on-camera actor is. You're the pencil, you're the pen, uh, you're, uh, you're a Sharpie, Jade, I mean, that's, that's literally, it's n none of them are bad. They're all good. The question is, what do we need today? Do we need a pencil? Do we need a pen? Or do we need a Sharpie? Because, I mean, I've lost jobs, so to speak, to African-American males, and I've lost jobs to Asian females. Now, I don't know how in the hell casting comes down on a given day to white dude and an Asian female, but it doesn't matter. And me learning how to have that not matter is how I learned how to protect myself as a Pisces artist versus the 5'10 Caucasian male of a certain age who's up for a job, employee, 
and in our subjective art business on that given day, they decided to hire a poodle instead of a German shepherd. And you can take that personally all day long if you want to. And this is part of what I've been talking to actors about for three decades. But if you do, chances are it's probably going to really affect your soul and it's going to affect your psyche rather than realizing, and I always do this ladies, so just know I'm doing it. That would be like a pump taking it personally one day because you went to the shoe store and had to get a sling back. And the pump actually screamed at you and threw something at you as you walked away from not buying it that day. And that's, I couch it in that way so that people, and I do it with cars, I, I do it with all sorts of things that we choose to buy on one day and then choose to buy something else the next day. And for me as an artist, it, to me, it's, it's, it just was necessary. Like I literally have a line in this book that says, I get my feelings hurt all the time by people, and I do. But Hollywood's never hurt my feelings because Hollywood is exactly what it tells you it is. It is a multi-billion dollar entertainment industry that uses human beings to make money. And if you don't want to be a part of that and or you discover that that doesn't work for you, it's no problem. U-Haul is still open. You can leave any day you want. And I mean that sincerely, not as a quitter. I mean that in terms of protecting your soul because you can be an actor anywhere. You don't have to be in LA. You don't have to be in New York. You don't have to be in Chicago. And you sure as hell do not have to do film and television. You can just do stage and enjoy yourself as an artist. There's no requirement. This is a decision that we make. So that's the way that I've managed to take my left brain and the way I grew up and protect my Pisces right brain in a business where they hire different pencils every single day. And that is wow. basically the philosophy. This is why he's a great speaker. He's a, this is why he's a motivational speaker. Because I felt motivated. Like, I felt like maybe I need to reevaluate my life choices. Oh, girlfriend. Oh, no, Thank you. you crushed There's me. a chapter right in here that would do it. All the decision. <laughs> Jay, did you have a question before I ask no, another ahead, one? Okay, ahead. I'm protecting my champagne now. Now that there's a box, and I've already lost the bottle, I'm going to try to regain, you know, to keep Get your bottle. glass back. Get your glass back now. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come on. <laughs> one time, she, she said something on the show, and I had poured her a glass of champagne, and then she, she oh, she, you rushed and took the beginning. Yes. I after did. we discussed it, out, and I just drank it in front of her face. It was great. The whole out. show, she's just, this is your champagne. Yeah, it's that doesn't really work out. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. no. So the, I've pan, the, pan, the pantomime champagne for improv, that doesn't really work out because it doesn't taste no, really it doesn't. good. No, it doesn't. That's the real thing. Uh, Crown Royal, just, you know, uh, with the glass, it says Crown Royal. There you go. Not that they're sponsor of the That's show. Good. I'm just saying. I, did. I like it. I like it very much. That looks like it tastes so good. <laughs> <laughs> it really did. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm just saying. Happy hour is coming soon. Um. Oh, okay, it's, it's after artists. 12 here, so I'm good. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're fine. Um, uh, so we should probably ask an artist question, which I wanted to do. Okay, artist question. Um, was how do you – I've always wanted to ask an actor this. And, like, since we actually have a, a – we already know you. Right. We have a rapport. I'm going to ask, how the heck do you fit all those people in y'all's brains? When you say fit all those people, how do you mean? You mean characters? Yes. Oh, like, no. On time. Yeah, that wouldn't. Um, I'm sure there are probably some actors who might answer that question that way. I would not. It would not be how do you fit all those people in that way. I want you to think about it like this. Uh, and this is exactly how I'm going to say it to y'all. Um, how many different recipes that are really good do you think there are ways to make chicken soup? An endless amount. Yeah. Uh, a bunch. Let's just call it a hundred. How about we just call it a hundred for the sake yeah. of the conversation? Okay. okay. Now, some of those different recipes might include some different ingredients, of course, but a lot of them even would still consider some of the same ingredients. So if you look at all the ingredients of chicken soup possibilities and look in the mirror and realize that you have all that in your life that you've already experienced from the intellectual part of your memories to the core soul of your part of your relationships and all the human different beings that you've met over the course of your time. Basically, I'm chicken soup. Which recipe would you like today? And I dial that up. And that's a character. Huh. I got, and one day you have more carrots, one day you have less carrots. One day you have more stock that you start with, one day it's a little more salt, a little more pepper. 
this is the part of what makes up you guys and all of us as human beings. So if I'm a human being simply portraying a human being, then I'm simply playing with what I've always called, this is the way Kevin talks about it in here, and I am in the middle of writing a dating book, and that's literally the whole dating book. I've always called everything by a music board. I know you guys have been in sound engineer studios and you see a big, huge soundboard, right? With all these dials and buttons. Well, that's the way I look at human beings. And that's the way I look at actually portraying a human being because technically we all, as human beings, we all have the same set of dials. But the combination of which ones are turned up to two, which ones are turned up to seven, which ones are at 10 or the joke in Spinal Tap. No, 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 sorry, this one goes to 11. Don't, don't touch it, don't even look at it. Um, just if you look at that movie and that scene from it, don't, don't even look at it. Um, that makes up a human being on a given day. And so our job, aside from learning lines and actually blocking and hitting your marks and all of that left brain crap that's going on simultaneously while you're doing all of this, our job is to look at the material that somebody has written and go, okay, what chicken soup am I going to make today? Name James, name Doug, name Billy, or in my case, name, I've been hired as a Dante and a Mario. You're going to have to explain this from this face. I don't know how you see this and go Dante. I'm like, okay, you need help. Uh, or much less Mario. Sorry, I'm not Latin, but thanks. Um, or Italian. But it's not so much the characters for me. It's much more the recipe of the soup. That's what makes up a character. It really answers so many it questions. It didn't answer no. so many questions. It did. It did. So <laughs> <how> did <laughs> I have ruined the show. <laughs> you have not ruined the show. It's a great thing. I mean, I come on my own show to learn something. I really so do. I really do. So I hope everyone out there comes on here to learn something. Or, you know, just to laugh with us because I like to laugh too. Like learn, laugh. Same difference, right? So how did you go from being an actor and um, an author? an author to being a, like a motivational speaker that you are? Well, uh, chicken versus the egg. I actually probably was, a, I was a motivational speaker. I was an educational speaker before I was an author. Now, let's go all the way back. When I was a kid, my mom was a singer, piano player, born with perfect pitch, had a voice like Patsy Cline. And I used to write poetry when I was a kid, little, little big kid. And so at one point she had wanted me to actually try to write songs. I've actually been trying to write two songs for about three years and I just can't get them done. So, uh, but I was probably a writer, ironically enough, first in my life. And yet it's the last thing that I've done in my life. In the process, what happened, uh, Jade, was in becoming an actor, I eventually accidentally, complete accident, wound up founding uh, an organization that just started out as a meeting in my apartment called the Actors Network. Now, if you look at the Actors Network and the posture comes after the S, plural possessive, um, it was actually quite a successful, well-known organization here in Hollywood that I'm the founder and president of that I ran for 23 and a half years from 1991 to the middle of 2013 when I physically closed the doors. It exists online, but not at all the same because it's not a, it was a physical meeting place. It was a learning place. So it's not the same, but that's what led to me why I wound up sitting in front of people sitting talking. We had groups. Eventually they were called power groups and I would facilitate them. We didn't use the word teacher. We didn't use the word workshop and we didn't use the word seminar because actors' egos are so fragile. No one ever wants to feel like they're not in charge. Um, so that's, and then I slowly started coming up with all these subjects, which is the basis of this book over the course of two decades to where I eventually would do what we called topical discussions. And that's when I began standing up in front of people. And again, I had been a stand-up comic. I had done improv. So crazy goofball brain going like this all the time, never sure which direction it's going in, coupled with the structure and the discipline of stand-up. And then I was speaking with people and asking questions and basically being a moderator, facilitator, host about a thousand times, at least, over the course of the life of the Actors Network. And so, and some of those times, obviously, I spent time on stage. I go into events. I spoke, I've spoken in Stockholm. I've spoken in the Ukraine. I've spoken at the Writers Guild. I've spoken at Showbiz Expo, uh, many universities. So that is kind of all before I even considered doing this now, Jade, in the corporate keynote motivational educational structure uh, of how that functions. But it's an easy transition for me because when I first started thinking about it and I started thinking, what, what would I want to speak on? 
because there are a lot of different categories, it became very simple to me because one of my biggest pet peeves in life is poor communication. So my, my, all of my platforms, and I do them for different industries with different titles and different subject matters, but they're all based in um, communication because my trademark, literally trademark, is AEI, audience, environment, and intent. And our communication is affected by those three things every single minute of every single day, and we actually don't understand them well enough, and that's why a lot of communication is poor. So that's what led to me becoming a, a corporate keynote speaker, Jade, and that's where the program comes from. It really comes from me having spoken on show business in front of actors for nearly 20, for since, for now, 29 years, because I do it still today um, at the American Film Institute here in Los Angeles, where you, I met you guys in person. Um, there, they provide a location for the Los Angeles Conservatory, which is part of Screen Actors Guild here in Los Angeles. And I speak there to actors every single month for free. Wow. So do you think the way that you have logic, okay, every question I've asked that I expected an artist answer to, there has been a logic analytical answer. We like it very much. I love it. It's nice. I absolutely love it. I think that's why we ended up being writers, logic analytical and creativity. This is all artists right here. That's all <laughs> artists. These two gift book series, Life in a Word, Politics in a Word, um, they have they have obviously left brain analytical parts to them. But when I came up with the idea for Kevin's Dictionary, Life in a Word, uh, it's 100% emotional. And uh, I got to be careful because I might start crying. Um, when I finished this book, um, if you read it, um, I had someone ask me this. Uh, they, they, a couple of friends of mine read it and they said, hey, man, I'm just curious because the book is, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, but a word can sometime be an entirely new picture. And the point of the book is, is that when you open it up, there's a word here. And so you look at the word, and that word is marriage. And we naturally think about the story being something related to marriage. And the whole point of the book is it isn't. And so it, 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 the desire is that the book wants you to look at a word in a different way and see the scene that I've written from life, the artistic moment that I took from life and go, yeah, that is like a marriage. I wouldn't have thought of it that way. Um, and so for me, putting this book together was pure artistic enjoyment. And then somebody asked me, how many of those stories, because there's 50 words in each one, so there's 50 stories in each one of these, um, how many of those actually happened to you? And I hadn't really thought about it the first time I was asked that question. And then I started thinking about it and I kind of counted them up and I realized that about 35 of the 50 were actually from my life. And yet the 15 or so that I just made up that I just literally didn't take artistic license and sort of shape something into this book that I just invented uh, four or five of them are, are four or five of my favorite ones in the book. Um, Playground is one of those that I just invented um, because I, it, it correlates to um, a morning on the floor of the American Stock Exchange. Um, I mean, the New York Stock Exchange, sorry, um, as a playground. So um, the pure Pisces of me, that's when I get to sit down and just purely play in my mind. And, uh, and it's still hard, but uh, it's very fun. And so that's, and while the dating part is going to have a lot of analytical logic to it, the truth of the matter is there's not a lot of analytical and logical about dating. And we get ourselves into that because we don't actually stop and think about some of the stuff we're doing in dating. And that's kind of the point of the book. But I, I want it to be this wonderful marriage of the two, but I'm also in the, in the process of simultaneously, I have three books and I'm probably going to finish the first draft of all three of them in June and July. That's my goal right now during COVID. Um, the two other books are humorous books. They're just, the problem is I'm going, to be have, I'm going to have six books on the market and none of them will go together because I'm just an idiot. I mean, that's what, one of the things I say when I speak. It's like, I am a goofball. Um, and those, those other two books that are just humorous based are like little fun, little novel, funny books. Those are just pure joy uh, for me to spend time writing. Pure joy. 
that. He's so an excellent fantastic. writer, y'all. Yeah. So if you guys are watching, Check you it should out. pick up those books, Life on Politics. Okay. They're really good. So we have the final question because, wow, Uh-oh. it's 20 minutes. It's amazing. Yeah, it has. Final bad. Jeopardy. Here it comes. I'm going to go for the Daily yeah. Double. Go ahead. Final question is where can people find more about you and your books online? And you're speaking. And you're speaking. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the most simple way would be to go to kevinewest.com. My middle initials E as in Edward, and that's not even my middle name. Uh, kevinewest.com is the easiest place. You can also find my two, my two, all three of my books at titletownpublishing.com uh, and or on Amazon. All three of those books are there. Uh, I'm easily uh, able to be followed at, Kev- at the Kevin E, and that's Instagram or Twitter. Um, you can find me there. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, but I'm not, I'm not hard to locate. And the three books, uh, Seven Deadly Sins the Actor Overcomes, Kevin's Dictionary Life in a Word, Kevin's Dictionary Politics in a Word, all on Amazon, all at titletownpublishing.com, or all of that, and as a speaker, which when you go to kevinewest.com, there's a nav bar right there that says speaker. And if you're an event planner or somebody who books speakers, every single thing there you'd want to know about me is right on that link. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for coming on. And like having a drink for us. Cause oh, no, I, I know. Because y'all are staying with champagne. And quite frankly, brother can't drink champagne or I'll just pass out. So I got to go with this. Champagne just gives me a <laughs> headache, makes me crazy. It's like, hey, did you guys lock Kevin up in the bedroom? Because that's where he needs to be if he's drinking champagne. But <laughs> if I can drink this Thank all day, and then we're completely fine. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. And I guess I'll just go ahead and wrap, wrap us up. up. Thank right. you, ladies, very so, much. You can find Everything your ladies are doing on www.andwethought.com. While you're there, take a moment, go to the ladies tab, go, go down to the middle of the page and see the charities that we probably support. Yes, we know that times are hard, so money might not be an option for you right now to support them with, but time or just donations of clothes, books, things like that, that is very important to them too, or just some knowledge. Because, you know, everyone can use some extra knowledge and wisdom. Thank you so much in advance. We really appreciate it. And just remember that wisdom is all around you. You're open to finding it and accepting it. So peace and love, you guys. From I'm doing professional today. Okay. From Wilona. Okay, then. And Jade. Bye-bye.